disruptors and curious minds welcome to another episode of thinking on paper my name is jeremy gilbertson i'm a nexus thinker i'm a founder <laughs> uh, in a program called right to know you it's a wellness mastermind that is powered by writing curiosity and empathy we have my co-host as always mark fielding is a writer lore developer and a guy that's worked with some of the biggest brands in the world to understand this intersection and today we're exploring in real time as we do every week this amazing experiment to stir the pot between humanity and technology. Uh, we're live today, but we're on Spotify and all podcast platforms. We're also on YouTube. If you like what you hear, please go to those platforms and push the button that either says like or subscribe, tells us how, we do, how we're doing. It also you know, makes us feel good when uh, we're putting stuff out there that resonates. Mark sure. Fielding, I want you to tell them about our book club. Tell them about our book club and what we're doing. Um could I also give myself the moniker of trainee Nexus Thinker as well? I like that. Ooh, Nexus uh, Thinker in progress? Yeah, Nexus Thinker, trainee Nexus Thinker, work experience. Young Jedi. Yeah, <laughs> yeah the, um, the the Thinking on Paper book club where we, where we read books in a communally immersive, entertaining, bi-directional knowledge exchange when we learn together. And yeah, once a week we dive into a chapter of a book. But we're an emerging tech culture podcast but the books sometimes cross mental models psychology philosophy they're very some we're going to do fiction so yeah hit the go to the website thinking on paper.xyz to check that out um and today's show jeremy copyright and ai i mean copyright copyright was a, a nightmare before artificial intelligence came onto the scene and made it even like exponentially worse my own experience i've got a vested interest in this because i write or i used to write a lot of fan fiction and actually when i wrote the apocalypse daddy the book i wrote some of that i, I actually i took out in the end because i'd taken um kind of film scripts and rewritten them and it's, it's like fan fiction and i'm not sure maybe our guest today can if there's any similarities between fan fiction and where the current rules stand with artificial intelligence and content, it'll be interesting to hear. I think, yeah, we might even get into that topic of, I guess, I guess, fair use as they, as they yeah. say, perhaps, but we could correct, we could be corrected very soon. Um, awesome. Well, uh, quick thanks to our sponsor, uh, Ripple, W R I P P L E marketing's on demand talent platform. These guys are great. They've enabled uh, the, this show for a long time, and uh, they do great things by bringing uh, vetted solopreneur freelancers that are really good at their work. Uh, P.S. Mark and I are on the platform as well, should you desire to find us. But uh, big brands use, these com use, use this company to help them stack these amazing interdisciplinary teams to handle these quick projects that come up and even long-term uh, programs in your company. So check them out, WRIPPLE.com. Without further ado, Mark, let's bring our guest on and let's talk about AI, the law, and art. Let's do this. Yeah, our guest, Anthony Grikov, um, practices IP, entertainment, and Web3 law in Los Angeles as an associate at Ramo Law PC. Um, very interesting in itself is a boutique law firm for the entertainment industry, which apparently started in the back lot of Universal Studios, which is a different story, perhaps. Um, and yeah, he specializes in um, Web3, artificial intelligence and copyright law. So yeah, welcome to the show, Anthony Glukov. Hey. hey, everyone. Great to be here. Very early good Anthony. morning to you, Anthony. Yes, uh, thank you. Welcome to the show. Excellent. Thanks for having me. Really excited to uh, to talk about all this stuff. It's a it's a long fascination of mine. So really happy to dive in and, and kind of help share some of uh, some of this. Excellent. Excellent. Well, let's uh, let's let's start from the top and let the let the fun rabbit holes uh, show us where to go beyond that. But we, we talked a little bit in in our pre-production chat about about the idea of whenever something new comes out, whether it's a technology or just a way of doing things right, it has to connect in meaningful ways to the existing systems that people are used to operating it, right? And if it doesn't do that, there there's a general disconnect and maybe it hinders adoption and that sort of thing. So we're talking about AI. How, what are the important pieces of the current legal system that are these interesting intersections and why are they so important? So, I mean, I think the big one that a lot of people are aware of is copyright, right? So it, it, under the current copyright regime, uh, we give very broad protection uh, almost immediately to any to any you know pieces that are copy copyrightable works, 
And the Copyright Act extends to uh, original works of authorship that are fixed in a tangible medium of expression. And that's a, that's a lot of words to say, basically, that you need to have kind of a, an original creative idea, uh, sorry, not idea, original creativity that you then fix, meaning it's it's solidified and it's, it's uh, immortalized in some medium, be it paper, it could be digital. Um, and, and that really sets the bedrock for what is protectable. And a lot of things tend to get swept up under that. You have, you know, literary works, you have dramatic works, sound recordings, architectural works, um, and that includes things like code. And that would automatically bring in all of the, the models that are created that run these, uh, these generative AI programs. It would include things um, that are created by those programs, any visual works, um, and any chat, you know, chat GPT spits something out necessarily. The question is, well, is that copyrightable? And so that's one kind of big regime. I think the other big regime that's uh, that's really kind of getting gaining prominence and, and gained a little bit of prominence uh, over the last couple of years is uh, the privacy regime and, and specifically publicity and privacy rights. Uh, because the question then comes up, well, we're developing technology, which is becoming increasingly adept at taking some image or some like some person's likeness and modifying it in ways which seem convincing to the human eye um, to generate something new, uh, to, to kind of simplify that. It's, we've got programs now that can make what looks like real people um, and can take those people and put them in different scenarios or even take real people and put them in scenarios and situations that they might never have been in. And so there are moral and ethical implications to that. But at the same time, there are sort of questions about, well, what rights do these people who are being copied have and, and that was kind of the bedrock or the foundation for a lot of the conflict uh, as some people might have been aware of between the the, the wga and, and sag and uh the amptp over this, this past uh, summer so those are kind of the two big things that people are, are looking at right now as far as the the legal intersection uh with ai is the key in there that first sentence you said original work and yes, how... absolutely. So, <laughs> sorry, go ahead. Well, no, yeah, that that seemed to me that, that, that I just jumped on that, and it's like, okay, it's how how do you define? Well, even taking AI out, AI out of the equation, how do you define originality? And then when you add AI to the mix, how do you define originality? Sure. Well, so for anyone who is uh, who's really interested in getting into the nitty gritty, uh, this is the language is found in a Title 17 of the U.S. Code, Section 102, which says in pertinent part, um, copyright protection subsists in original works of authorship fixed in any tangible medium of expression now known or later developed from which they can be perceived, reproduced or otherwise communicated either directly or with the aid of a machine or device. So it's a lot of words. The first part of what is original, um, that really, there's a long history behind that, right? I mean, this co the copyright protection in the US is, it stems from the, the constitution and it has seen different iterations over the years as the Copyright Act has been sort of remolded and revamped. But uh, we've got cases that go back significantly um, that really spell out what it means to be original and what it what is originality there, um, and and some of the these like foundational cases have have sort of morphed. One one in particular uh, is there's a the case this case from uh, 1991, which is not not that old. Uh, that's <laughs> but it is uh, it's called Feist Publications uh, versus Rural Telev uh, Telecommunication Services, and in that case the the court sort of talked about uh, what originality is. It's got two components. It's independent creation and sufficient creativity, right? So you need to have been sitting there by yourself or with a team, you know, a group of people need to be creating this thing uh, in order uh, to have that first box checked. And secondly, there has to be some modicum of creativity. And, and the, the bar is basically on the floor for a lot of things, but you need to have some level of creativity to distinguish your work from something else's. Because the last thing we want is to be handing out copyright protection, like candy to everybody walking by and find that everyone's got overlap in work. So where do you actually draw the line to, to kind of section off the rights of one person versus another? And so those two pieces together kind of form the, the basis for, for original authorship. And then, like I was saying, the, the, the tangible medium of expression part um, happens to come from well, where are you embodying this work, right? There, there have been cases that have 
challenge the question of, of fixation by looking at where the media, uh, what the media is and where the work might be stored, if it is stored at all. And, and the courts have found that, you know, the, the, the threshold there is also very low. Like we don't want to bar people from copyright ownership or copyright protection to the extent that it, it's, uh, you know, applicable or valid here. But at the same time, we need to have some level, uh, some threshold requirement where the work can't just be momentarily in transit, right? You can't just have some sort of generated image which never gets stored um, or saved anywhere be protected because then how do you compare that against something else in order to uh, designate what the, the, the contours of that protection are? Man, you got, yeah, you got my brain spinning already. Like I, I <laughs> yeah, so a, co a common theme, uh, Anthony, that we run across in the show quite a bit is, is uh, hierarchical systems and emergent systems, right? And I would almost argue that the legal side is kind of the hierarchical system. The creative side is this more emergent system and how these two, two work together. So what makes, like, what is creativity? Like, what's a created thing? What's a unique created thing? And I start thinking about, all right, creativity is, and this is just my definition. This is not a legal definition, but like, it's the unique rearrangement of found elements, right? So I can look at two things, right? I can look at letters and how I arrange letters into words and combinations. I look at my guitar that's sitting back there and I look at the notes that make up a chord, the chords that make up a chord progression, but like, I can't own a G chord, right? Mark can't own the word unique. Like wh where's the jump off point and, and how does it, how does the legal system navigate? I know you answered it a little bit, but let's continue to unpack that a little bit. I mean, I, I think the, the answer is the legal system struggles. Look, I mean, you look at the, like the blurred line case, um, that was really, really, um, a, a real hot topic several years ago. And this continues to be in, in a lot of ways where there were, questions about, well, can you really copyright or can you have copyright ownership over a style? Um, and that goes to your question of, well, can you copyright a G chord? And then the answer is really no. I mean, we need to have some flexibility for others to step in. The, the goal of copyright is not to give someone a monopoly power. That's sort of more the, the realm of patents. What copyright is trying to do is, is say, is acknowledge that there is value in some works that are created. And by ascribing that value uh, and protecting that value, we are encouraging the the useful arts, as they call it, uh, to create and proliferate um, more and more works. As it, as it will overall help the, I guess the the utility. It'll create and contribute to greater utility in society as a whole. Um, so, when it comes to creativity, right? I mean, let's let's sort of think about it in terms of a sentence. Uh, if you were to write some some sentence like. I woke up today and had eggs. Um, we might not say there's sufficient creativity there because how much, how many people have made or uttered that thought in the past? So there's a little bit of, of historical context that goes into it. Um, but if you know you were to, for example, uh, write in uh, write that same sentence uh, like you know, uh, "Yar matey, I am uh, <laughs> a swashbuckler and had me eggs this morning." That might start to qualify, and, and that's like a very a super contrived example. But the first thing that comes to mind, right, is we'll we'll often um, examine creativity in the negative, and the, it's useful because if we sort of exclude certain categories of things that aren't given copyright protection, we can start to narrow in on what does make sense. So. That, that same uh, section 102 of the Copyright Act goes on to say that copyright doesn't, uh, doesn't extend to any uh, ideas, procedures, processes, systems, uh, methods of operation, let me see, concepts, principles, of, or discoveries, right? So it's a, it's a long list that they're trying to sort of, with each word, bring the walls in just slightly more to, uh, to narrow that definition and, and that scope of protection. And I think that uh, there's a long line of cases too that go into saying, all right, well, is this thing that we're looking at really some form of creativity or is it an idea? Is it creativity or is this just like a method of operation? Um, and, and, and that is you know, a, another inquiry in and of itself. So to, to kind of, <laughs> to come back high level, the question of creativity is not simple and the courts know it's simple, attorneys know it's not simple. It's 
one that we have to kind of take on a case by case basis. And in examining each individual thing, we have to keep in mind those those pieces that are not protectable and compare the two to make sure that we're not, you know, overextending copyright protection in a way that would jeopardize creativity or uh, development in, in some other ways. I think you mentioned blurred lines and I think you're talking about the song. Could you just give us a couple of other cases that our, our listeners can and we can go and investigate after the event just to think, see how this might be working? Like edge, edge cases where the, the the law could have gone either way, perhaps? Well, there's, there's the Sam Smith, um, Tom Petty thing is probably another similar to the blurred lines, right? Yes. And, and it, it, I, the Feist case that I mentioned earlier is another great example. Um, the Feist case was there were two competing publications of, uh, of white pages and yellow books. Um, and, and pardon me, I forget exactly which one was at issue. But uh, the, the, the gist of the case was one company had been operating this, this book and had been compiling addresses um, for a, a small rural community. The other uh, was a much larger operation and wanted to uh, incorporate a lot of those listings in its own publication so that it could you know, sell it to, to users, make profit off of it and such. And they went to the, the rural publication and said, hey, we would like to license from you this list of phone numbers and addresses and names. Would you give it to us? And they kind of said, yeah, not really. Uh, you know, we're, we're competitors. We don't want to get into that. So we will pass. So the, the first said, all right, that's fine. We'll just take it anyway. And so they took all these things and they put them in their own publication. Of course, the rural ones sued and said, hey, you can't, you know, can't do this. This is our copyrightable work. And the question became, well, what exactly is, is copyrightable here? Is this sufficient creativity? Or is this just an idea um, in, in terms of the list of names and phone numbers and such? And the court says basically, you know, no, it's not really creative, right? Like what? what are the ways that you can arrange a, a list of names or addresses alphabetically, numerically, that's, that's, that's insufficient, doesn't meet the modicum of creativity that we need. So um, that's not going to be enough to pass, uh, to pass muster here. Uh, some other cases, uh, in terms of the, the line, there was uh, the line of cases between Google and Oracle, which is uh, very big, um, in terms of creating copyright protection over APIs. Uh, where the court ultimately ruled, and that gets into the question of fair use, the court ruled that Google's use of Oracle's uh, APIs in creating the Android uh, operating system was fair. Um, and, and that is another sort of tech-centric way, uh, tech-centric case, examining the contours of what is protectable, what is not protectable, and where something is protectable, how far can we go in, in sort of utilizing that for someone else? That's really that's really interesting. So before we've got some great questions coming in, Mike Harris, Odell, I see you guys out there. Uh, we're gonna we definitely want to get to get get to those API though. I want to stay on that really quick, Anthony, because I always I always look to the past to help me understand the future and the present and all of that good stuff, right? So if I had if I had a creation, if I had a song, right, and I wanted to just let anyone you know use pieces and parts of that song to make it whatever they want to make it. Isn't it very similar to me, like creating API access to my IP? Like, is there anything that we could lean on in those frameworks to like consider how that could work in the future based on how it worked in, um, you know, legal with APIs? So, I, I mean, there's definitely a lot of parallels there. I think the, the argument is, right, I create an API. It's sort of like a set of tools for you to play in my, my sandbox, right? I'm giving you permission to be in the sandbox and I'm giving you a, a set of, like, you know, I'm giving you a pail, I'm giving you a shovel, you can do these things and you can do specific things with my sandbox using those tools. Um, when, I'm, when I'm thinking about distribution of a song uh, and, and you're talking about allowing people to utilize it, it's allowing them to really take the sandbox in non-specific ways. So it kind of gets more towards like a Creative Commons license or some other um, like a CC0 license or, or some other license that is not as tightly regulated where people can utilize. So there's, there's a slight, I, I feel like there's a slight difference there. Um, but nonetheless, there, the, the parallel there is in saying, all right, we're okay with this copyrighted work, a copyrightable work being utilized by the public. The question is, how, where are we drawing the lines and how? 
on the one end in the song case, you've got this very broad expression that you're allowing people to, to take with your song, right? You can sample it, you can reuse it, you can cut it up, put it in commercials, you can, you can you know, print it out on CDs and distribute those if anyone does that anymore. Uh, whereas on the other, you're saying, all right, I've got the software stack and I'm giving you specific entry points into that stack and specific latch points that you can access to, you can pull data and utilize yourself, but I don't necessarily want to, uh, you know, reveal the source code or reveal other components of it. Um, and what was really interesting in the Google case was the, the there are um, the, the four factor um, test for fair use. And uh, we can get into that a little bit uh, as well, but the, the court kind of looked at this situation as a whole, as it often does under these fair use analyses and said, look, we find that it's important for society as a whole to sometimes permit certain uses. And here, this is an example where we think Google is doing something really good and it's necessary for them to use this API because it's something that all these developers that they've hired already know how to use. It's something that other people that would potentially be developing for the platform would know how to use. And so they're only using a small amount of, of, of this uh, or whatever is necessary really for them to be able to, um, to pull out what they need. And it, it starts to create a more, a larger societal benefit. And so to that end, they said, yeah, it's fair use. We're going to allow it because we think that there's um, there's a real benefit to to society, to, to humanity uh, in allowing this type of activity conti to continue. And it's an example of, of how the courts often play sort of uh, not just judge in the legal sense, but also in the ethical uh, and societal sense of trying to <laughs> figure out where people might be most benefited and how. Okay. I like the idea of... <coughs> I'm not sure if I do like the idea of judges being the ethical decision makers in that. Um, can, can I just, um, I don't know, before we get to the questions in the chat, I just want to move it over towards coding and AI generated coding and coders working in collaboration with AI. And I. I create a new program with the help of chat GPT who owns the copyright? Well, uh, the answer is, uh, it depends as lawyers love to say, but really, uh, it, the, the, the consensus seems to be, uh, nobody right now. And, and that's really dependent on, of course, how much of the program is being created. I mean, if you're, if all you're doing is you're sitting there with chat GPT and you got the prompt window open and, you are just code prompting, basically, saying, write uh, a, a set of code that does this. The copyright office and the courts agree that is insufficient to grant copyright because the uh, going back to that the definition, right? Uh, original works of authorship. Uh, there's a longstanding principle that authorship can only subsist in a human creator. We can't have a uh, a machine or a programmatic creator obtain copyright protection. And then there, even before AI was really emerging on the scene, there were cases that changed challenges. One of, one of my favorites being uh, the Naruto case, which uh, Naruto, Naruto was a, uh, a macaque in, I believe, Indonesia. And there was a photographer who put a camera down in this wildlife reserve and uh, they, the monkey found it, uh, picked it up and started taking <laughs> pictures of themselves. And Amazing. it was like, you know, well, the monkey's making obviously is intelligent enough to know what this camera is. They're taking selfies. Like how, of course they know what this is. Uh, and of course they would want copyright protection. How could you not afford it to them? And of course, then the court goes and looks at this, says, mm, not quite. We need a human author. Uh, the, the macaque is not sufficiently, uh, it doesn't meet the definition of human. So we can't afford copyright protection there. And this was a, of course, a, a case that was, you know, it, it seems silly, but it, there were other motives behind it because uh, I think it was instituted by uh, PETA. And the, the idea was if you can afford protection to uh, an, an copyright protection, it is the first step on the road to affording greater rights to uh, to animals. So it was it was very cleverly constructed in that way. Um, but yeah, you couldn't have authorship subsist in a non-human creator. So to the extent can't that you, you're but sorry, can't, can't you? I might be wrong. Can't you afford copyright to a to a company or a brand? You can't, but there has to be sufficient human creation there. So what will happen in the case where you have a company 
taking copyright ownership. <coughs> Excuse me. The company itself will take copyright ownership through what's called the work made for hire provision of the Copyright Act, which there are a couple of ways to get <coughs> work made for hire protection. One way is <coughs> you have some sort of written agreement, right? So let's say you hire me to paint you uh, some sort of portrait. Uh, I would I would sort of uh, dissuade you from doing that because I'm not the greatest painter, but let's say you decide anyway, yeah, I want you to do it. We'll have an agreement. In that agreement, you'll say, I'm specifically hiring you for the purpose of creating this as a work made for hire under the Copyright Act, and, and I will be you know, the author from the date of its inception. And so I create it. I'm not the author. You're the author immediately. And that's sort of route one. Route two is there's an employee working within the scope of their employment for some company. So if I am uh, an employee of company X and all we do is we, I guess shouldn't use that. Let's say I'm a company, I'm an employee of company Z. And I can't believe we can't use that example anymore. It's just... I know, right? <laughs> so I'm an employee of company Z and all we do is we create art prints, right? I don't have authorship. I've signed an employment agreement that says, yeah, company Z, you are the, you're going to be the author of all these things. There is a human. So it does sort of tick that box, but the, the company itself doesn't have the autonomy and the, the necessary humanity to be able to, to satisfy that first requirement. So the employees do, they, they kind of create the work, the authorship flows up through the work made for hire provision, and then the, the authorship will subsist there. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, a lot of a lot of really good questions uh, rolling in. So let's 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 try and uh, unpack Mike Harris's question here. And I think, you know, a lot of it, you know, there there is there's precedent for existing material being a catalyst for innovation for something new. Right. And, you know, how much of that existing information is used and all that we've been talking about creativity and defining creativity, hierarchical systems, defining emergent systems. Right. But what what um, other than kind of what's happening with the scale and the speed of creation that AI allows us to do, what are some of these unique challenges coming up for the legal system and for, for people and creators post open AI era? Like what, what are some of the, what are some of the hot buttons there? And I think you hit on some of them, but maybe we can expand. expand. Yeah. So, um, you know, I work in, with a lot of film and television production companies and, uh, for anyone who's not familiar with the industry, Oftentimes, like let's say you're making a documentary, you're going to want to use what they call archival footage or old photographs, uh, foot, video footage of some event. If you're if you're you know making a documentary about the the creation of uh, pizza in the United States, you might want to reference videos or p photographs of the different you know pizzerias in the country, right? And you don't have those, so you necessarily will have to go and find some license or maybe there's a, a news station that covered some pizza shop opening up and you want to use their video footage. Right. And so that's an expensive industry. I mean, it takes a, it, it, it's a lot of money that goes into licensing uh, the, the materials and also a lot of money um, to pay attorneys like myself to go and negotiate those licenses. So a lot of companies are thinking, well, what could we do uh, as far as like making this a cheaper endeavor for us. And of course, uh, generative AI presents a really great solution. Like, why would you need to go in a license archival footage when you can have some, uh, some generative AI protocol create it for you? So the, the question then becomes, well, all right, we've got this, this, this photograph, let's say, that was created by AI, and we want to include it in our film. Uh, of course, when you're creating a film, you're ultimately selling it to someone or licensing it to someone, be it you know Netflix or an Amazon or Hulu, whoever, right? And they want to make sure that they have you know, no doubts, there's no challenge to the copyright ability and the copyright protection of the program. Generally speaking, the film, the, the, the television series will be copyrightable, but then it's got this piece in it that, like I, just, like I said earlier, is not going to be copyrightable. So how do you kind of navigate that? Uh, and and, that, and that's a big question right now is, all right, to the extent that there are copyrightable works being created where we're incorporating non-copyrightable works because they're, you know, they don't have a human author, how do we get around that protection? How do we figure it out um, the best way for companies to be able to still, you know, produce these, these cre uh, creative works, but utilize uh, this new technology? 
and, and that's, you know, like I said, not really clear yet. We're, we're still kind of figuring it out. And a lot of studios and networks are still figuring out their, their tolerance level and, and their, uh, their appetite for risk on these things, uh, especially with a lot of the cases coming out where people are alleging that any output created by uh, generative AI is itself an infringing derivative work. And that's a kind of a different rabbit hole that we could go down. But there are a lot of uncertainties there. And so right now, I think people are, are trying to, you know, we'll, we'll come to someone like myself and they'll say, hey, we have this idea. We want to put this, you know, X, Y, Z pieces in this uh, documentary or this production that were generated by AI. Can you give us a legal opinion on whether or not this is going to be sufficiently safe uh, for us to incorporate? And we'll go and we'll, we'll pull out, you know, the, we'll talk about the different the precedential cases, the, the cases that might be bubbling up through the, the judicial system and say, yeah, this is fine. This is not fine. So that's kind of the the, the biggest hurdle or obstacle right now. Um, the second being, let's say you are utilizing uh, generative AI to create a photograph of some person because you don't want to license archival footage of that particular person. Well, then it brings in all the other questions of the right of publicity and the privacy rights of that person and whether or not you can actually utilize that. And that's uh, again, another sort of separate inquiry from the copyright side of things under a separate legal regime. Um, and those are really the big, two of the biggest obstacles right now, um, aside from the fact of uh, the obvious, well, how do you get it to output something that is even like what, what you want? Like, how do you prompt it in the right way? Yeah, I think w one thing in, you know, I've, I've, I've been on some of these platforms, like we all have kind of messed around and in, in, in that sort of thing. But like, what's, are there any platforms out there that are that have 100% cleared and verified all of their source material? Meaning, you know, if you have an AI platform, Anthony, and your source material is coming from Mark and I, Mark and I have 100% agreed that you can do anything you want with the source material. Has anyone ever done that yet? Or are they starting to do that? Like, I think that would be an interesting avenue for someone to jump into. It'd be yeah, pretty, you know. pretty terrible um, AI, AI protocol, wouldn't it? <laughs> Yeah, I, you know, I'm not really sure. I, I don't think so. Is is the is my answer? I, I think that the majority of uh, models that are out there right now have at some point trained on the databases that have infringing works. Like OpenAI has pretty much admitted it. The uh, the other uh, big players in the industry have similarly admitted to the fact that there are copyrightable works included in their data set. They're really heavily relying on the fair use. Uh, side of things to to argue, yeah, no, well, obviously we took this, we need to. It's a, it would be impossible, like Mark was saying, it would be a, a pretty crummy AI if you didn't utilize copyrightable work, if you're only relying on things in the public domain or things which you license. Um, it's too cost prohibitive to license everything. These are all arguments that people are, are throwing out there. Um, so there's there's this question of well, what uh, where where are we going to draw the line? But to my knowledge, there's no one out there who's really like buttoned up. I, I know for a fact that like the, the New York Times case uh, against OpenAI, they were talking about it. They were in conversations about, well, how can we license all of your, your content or a certain portion of your content to incorporate in the training data set of our, uh, of, of our models? And th those talks fell through. And then, you know, now New York Times is suing and they've done, uh, allegedly, they've done some very clever. Yeah, some, some massaging to, yeah, the, yeah. to the prompts and to the. But um, on the, I think it, it, there's a, a group of authors, John Grisham and some other authors who are suing OpenAI. And I think there's been a couple of cases that have gone to court and the judges have sided against the artists and the creators. I mean, where are we? I mean, are John Grisham and the authors going to, are they kind of setting the scene for what happens next? Or are they, is it going to go to fair use, as you say, and they'll be pushed out? How, how do you think it's going to play out? I, so I think that the, the fair use is an affirmative defense, right? So it's not necessarily a, uh, a, a kind of cure-all for this, this question of, are you infringing? It's, a part of the process of someone asserts a claim saying you're infringing, you you come back and say, no, I'm not. Why? Because uh, my use is protected. It's protected by a fair use doctrine. Um, and so there's this kind of push and pull. There are a lot of cases bubbling up right now and there are cases against open AI, against Meta, against Microsoft, against stability. Like all these different companies are basically being sued by like John Grisham, by the Authors Guild, by by various actors within the, the copyright community um, to 
basically try and tease out what these uh, what the answers are here. I think that the the question of fair use seems to be where most things are, are, are kind of landing and where they're sticking. And um, there, there's no definitive answer yet because the the way that the, the hierarchical judicial system works, right? It's like a lot of these cases are, are still at the district court level. There's always going to be room for them to be appealed to the to the circuit court level, and then from there, uh, it could ultimately be uh, you know appealed to the Supreme Court, which would then uh, sort of as arbiter of the land decide. All right, well, here is the patchwork of decisions that have come uh, come up from the various circuits and the district courts within them. Uh, we're going to try and consolidate these different the, the different disparate kind of opinions into one cohesive frame framework and oftentimes they they you know wax poetic for pages and pages and don't really don't really get to a, a distinct or definitive conclusion but kind of give you this this really vague answer um, and that's kind of what I expect is going to happen here as well right for the time being um, there there isn't a lot of clarity and I think a lot of people are um, really poking around to see what can be accomplished uh, there was a really great um, kind of research compilation that was put out in late September by Congress that cited to this question of what is fair use in the, the with respect to AI and how does it fit within the copyright regime? What is copyrightability when it comes to AI? And they, they examined a lot of these cases and a lot of the questions that are currently bubbling up. And so I, I'm excited to see <clears throat> where that is going to go. Uh, and I, I recently um, worked on uh, Pepperdine national entertainment law moot court competition which is a, a, a moot court competition they hold um they used to be annually they're kind of booting it up again after covid and i wrote the prompt for that which was about a fictional sort of entity uh called samurai or samurai ai uh that had created a generative ai program to create videos and as part of its training data set incorporated uh the the king of the gourds trilogy of films uh, which, uh, you know, is a, a little bit of a, a twist on a another famous trilogy of films involving a fellowship. And so there was there were questions that I kind of peppered in there to dance and, around that. That was nice. Yeah, <laughs> it, was, it was a really, really fun time. And so uh, the, the, there were um, schools from across the country that, you know, came together and and presented oral argument. They all wrote briefs on various sides on the, the, the petitioner respondent side, either arguing for or against fair use. And then they came to the, the law school and they had oral argument. And there were some really, really clever uh, arguments that came up about, well, this should or should not be considered fair use on the one hand, right? There are two questions. So let me back up. There were two questions. The first question is, all right, we've got this company. They've, they've admitted to ingesting uh, these, these copyrightable works as part of the training data set. Is it still protectable as fair use? Right. So that's kind of looking at the input. Then on the output side of things, the question was, does the output, because there, in, in this prompt, it sort of created this, this scene where uh, had a, what a, um, Gangdolf, uh, the beige, has, is in a field and he whistles to his trusty steed, uh, Carfax, uh, a saddled narwhal, right? And the narwhal comes prancing through the field, reminiscent of another uh, similar scene. And the question was, all right, well, does that video then uh, of a narwhal sort of replacing, be, or Gangdolf being replaced by uh, Mickey Mouse, which I can say now that public domain, uh, <laughs> Mickey Mouse is replacing Gangdolf here, uh, and there's a narwhal instead of a horse. Are, are these things derivative works of the original King of the Gourds scene, right? Um, and so that's addressing the output side of things. And those are the two questions that are co like constantly, co like all the cases you see bubbling up. Those are the two things being challenged. It's Is beginning there to sound like a Monty Python stick sketch. <laughs> Wouldn't, you know, I'm flattered. That's, that's quite, a, quite flattering. <laughs> no, that's amazing. I think I think a lot of the questions and Charlie Northrup, great to see you in the chat. Previous guest um, knows a lot about this stuff. And I think a lot of you know Charlie's question, given the statistical model, is built around using these original works, right? Who the infringer is, who you know a potential contributory infringer is, if any, right? I think we talked through some of that. Um, you know, interestingly, in real time, um, we there was another. Um, I think Odell had a question earlier in the chat, and I've seen a lot about uh, this word. And you might have to walk me through this, uh, Anthony, because I'm I'm not even close to an attorney, but like. The, the idea of this word transformative, right? And mm. how that applies to existing work and what makes a work transformative enough 
to potentially be a new work. Is that how that all sits and that word is used? Yeah, so the, the transformative is part of the analysis of fair use, right? So I, I kind of hinted at this earlier, but fair use is uh, an analysis that examines what they call the totality of the circumstances under four factors, right? So the first factor is the purpose and character of the use uh, and whether that, including whether that use is commercial or if it's not pro nonprofit, right? The, the second factor is what is the nature of the copyrighted work, right? Is this the kind, are we borrowing or taking from a work which sits at the core, the heart of copyright? Is this some sort of novel? Is this a, 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 a visual work of some sort <laughs> that really comes to the, the core of what we want to protect under the copyright law? The third factor is the amount and substantiality of the use, right? Um, in relation to the whole, are you taking the entire film and repurposing that? Are you taking the entire book? Are you only taking a sentence out of this one page of a thousand page book, right? What is the percentage of the work that you use where you've got more, uh, your, the, the more of the work that you use, the less it weighs in favor of fair use, generally speaking. Then the last being uh, the effect of the use on the, the market or the potential market or the value of the original work. And this transform the question of transformativeness really goes to uh, that first factor of what is the purpose and character of the use. And there was a really great uh, case that came out last year. Uh, it was Andy. It was the Andy Warhol Foundation uh, against uh, this uh, photographer, where the court was really uh, kind of backpedaling a little bit on what transformative means. Um, but the the gist of it is. Are you taking the work, the original work, and are you doing something to it in a way that really changes the character of, or that really, you know, modifies it in such a way that it furthers the purpose of copyright so that we're adding to the creativity or we're recasting this work in a new light? Um, and in the context of the, the Andy Warhol case, they, the, the question was about this photograph that uh, Andy Warhol had taken of Prince. The photograph was licensed to a magazine to be printed in the cover. Um, and it was for one magazine. Years later, after Prince passed away, uh, the, the, the silk print that uh, Andy Warhol had made of this photograph that was featured on the magazine was again reused by the, that same magazine um, to kind of commemorate his death in, in, in this uh, publication. And the photographer sued and said, no, you can't use it. it was for a license it was a single use license and it was only for that one publication and you've exceeded that and the, the foundation argued well no obviously this work is is fair use because it's transformative we took a photograph and we recast it look at how different this silk screen is right look how different the elements are it looks nothing like it um and the court said yeah not quite because part of that transformative analysis is where are you using it and what is the context and and what exactly is being done to it and in one case, you had in one instance, you had the use of a photograph to make a silk print, uh, silk screen print um, that was for a magazine cover. And then the other, it was also used on a magazine cover. So sorry, not transformative enough. Um, and then you look at uh, the, the there's another case, uh, Campbell versus A Cup Rose, which is very uh, big in the transformative uh, inquiry. And in that case, the uh, two live crew had um, repurposed the the song, the, the tune from a uh, pretty woman and created their own version. And the question was, well, all right, they, they're creating this rap version of the song. They're changing a lot of the lyrics and they're sort of poking at the, the, the purpose of the original. This is sufficiently transformative. Uh, and and, and it, if it seems a little hand wavy, it kind of is. I mean, the courts will often like sit, it, it, look, it's a, it's a person at the end of the day. These are not omnipotent beings that are somehow divining some or you know, ordained truth onto us. There are people like you and me who are sitting there trying to get it right. And they're thinking, all right, well, we've got this new emerging genre of music. We don't necessarily want to stifle it. And this, the part of this is figuring out how do we draw, where do we draw the line so that things are fair for both sides. We want to encourage creativity, but at the same time, we don't want to completely negate the protection that is given to the original author.
yeah this it's it's definitely like murky murky waters like for sure so our, our audience lines. Tra- our, <laughs> right blurred lines right our audience yeah. is definitely tracking like almost in real time with this conversation which yeah, is amazing that- we have another uh, uh another audience member chiming in about the you know, weird al yankovic right so you talked about transforming tunes is is i mean is that kind of the fair use the parody aspect of this i thing? think like weird weird al yankovic Yank- yankovic he he got permission from the original artist normally did he not does that that makes a difference yeah he's he's generally I, I i'm almost certain that he's going and licensing the rights i mean in, in music as you know uh jeremy there, there, there's those two parts right there's the sound recording and then there's the musical composition and so he's probably going and licensing the the rights to the musical composition um to to be able to modify and trans and transform it uh or, or create his own version of it right but uh parody and satire are big questions as part of that transformative inquiry where we often will say all right uh if something is pair is a parody a true parody right uh, it gets it, it, it typically tends to be transformative in nature because it can't make a you can't make a parody without borrowing from the original work right otherwise the, the, there would be no periodic effect so there is a, a sort of a uh, fair use is necessitated in these contexts and we want to permit that in order to again facilitate creativity and, and more creation of these of these parodies. I think the, the the biggest thing that, that that my biggest takeaway on this one is like there's no easy takeaway, and a lot of it is <laughs> yeah. a lot of it is like kind of like you know having your ducks run because you think about like think about going back to hip hop, right? So you have like the most sampled guy in hip hop is a guy named Bob James, you know, a transformative jazz artist, like amazing amazing work, but like a lot of his stuff really defined the the, the very basis of the sound that hip hop is now known for, right? But you start thinking about, all right, if I bring in like a hi-hat pattern from this record and I put it into the song and I use it as my song, then you start thinking, even though it is used, how influential is that used to making that thing what it is? And there's a lot of subjectivity to all of this stuff. You look at the framework, right? But you have a hierarchical system trying to be creative with subjectivity a little bit as well. Oh, absolutely. I mean, there are entire genres of music that are really fundamentally centered on one thing. Like, look at drum and bass, where the amen break was the thing, right? Like, if you didn't have the amen break and you didn't, you didn't incorporate that, you weren't quite getting it. But that was the, the sort of foundation for that genre. And then it later took off and, and started to, to incorporate more things and more elements. Uh, there's There's a lot of this sort of thing happening in music, especially where you find that there are specific pieces that are so instrumental to capturing a particular style um, that we want to be able to protect that. We want to encourage that sampling is instrumental to the development of, of rap because it was the, the core sound that really served as the, 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 the foundation for a lot of these tunes to be able to, retell a story and it was a big part of that storytelling was in recasting these these pieces from other artists and and sort of paying homage to them so yeah i I mean i totally agree i i i I used to say that i'm a music producer on the side i unfortunately haven't had as much time to do it but whenever you're you know when you sit down and you're trying to make a song you're looking to your your inspirations your your creative predecessors right like for me um, there are artists that have been really instrumental in my music knowledge, my formative music knowledge. And I will look to them in creating whatever work that I'm doing. I might sit down with a guitar and write a, a melody that is reminiscent of some other song by Depeche Mode that I, I really listened to as a kid. Um, but the process is similar, right? If you are doing that versus you are sitting and you're cutting up a break from some jazz record so that you could lay down, you know, some lay down a beat for a track, uh, it's it's very much the same thing. You're just applying that creative inspiration in a in a different way. Yeah. No. Ab- absolutely. Um, so I want I want to be mindful of time, but I do have one question. I think that that would be really helpful for for brands because we have a lot of brands that you, you know that that listen to the show to figure out like how to apply and and make sure they're using these emerging techs in, in the in the right way. So if you were to advise a brand and we let's not call it advice because i know we got to be careful but if um if 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 i have a brand and i've got a team of people working underneath me um and you know those that team of people is in a marketing department let's say so the marketing department is writing copy the marketing department is putting graphics together using logos all of that kind of stuff what's um how can i make sure my team 
understands what is okay to use from an AI perspective and what isn't? Like, how would you, how would you kick that discussion off? Okay. So fundamentally, I would say, assume that anything that comes out of an AI is not copyrightable. Anything that is popping out of uh, chat GPT, anything coming out of uh, mid journey or Dolly, not going to be copyrightable, right? Where you can get some sort of copyright protection is when you have human intervention. So if I were um, a brand, right? And again, uh, sorry, I should prep this, not legal advice, but um, if I have a brand and I'm creating these things, right? I would utilize ChatGPT to create marketing copy. And then I would maybe generate four, five, six, seven, whatever number of different uh, outputs. And then I would take them and I would sit down and sort of as an editor, pull together the pieces that I want and create a complete final copy based on that. And in doing so, I won't get the protection on the individual elements that were might have, you know, that might have been taken from the different prompted outputs, but I will get protection over uh, the the whole compilation and the assembly of those pieces. And that's kind of like the, the, the Zarya of the Dawn um, graphic novel situation where the AI generated specific images and they were woven together into a story and we get certain protection to the narrative aspects and the overall story as a whole. The second thing is when it comes to images, it's a similar sort of thing, right? If you want to create the image, it doesn't matter how much prompting you do to kind of focus the image in on one particular thing or another, it's not going to change the, uh, the particular uh, copyright protection. But if you're taking and you know, you're photoshopping different pieces together, you will get protection potentially over the compilation or the assembled final piece. So if Mark's on my team, he's a copywriter, I'm the CMO, he uh, jumps on ChatGPT to help kick off an article that is you know, going to be some kind of thought leadership piece for me and, and the company and everybody, right? It, are we going to start seeing a beneficial tag on the bottom of that that says, you know, created by Mark Fielding with the assistance of AI? Like, is that how we get a, get into this? Or, I mean, I would challenge people to think, well, what is AI um, fundamentally, which is, I, I know, a very open-ended question, but we've been using AI for years. We just never really called it that, right? If you're going into Photoshop and you're using certain tools built into Photoshop, they're are AI elements or machine learning elements that have been built into that, that software suite to help facilitate certain transformations. Right. Um, and, and in a fun, in a fundamental way, I, I sort of challenge the, the, the prevailing thought on AI and, and as a tool um, and say, well, to what extent is this just another tool that humans are using to then further their creative output? Right. Um, and I think there have been a lot of people that have tried to, this challenge and it hasn't worked yet. It could work. I think it should work um, because we as a society are progressing in our thought. We're progressing in the, the, the technology we have available. And so we have to adapt a little bit to how these resources are being utilized. And maybe the classification of what is a tool versus what is, you know, a separate entity needs to change. Deep questions. What a, what a fascinating discussion, Anthony. We, we appreciate you joining. The, the one, one kind of lingering question that I'll add on to what you said for, for the listeners out there is, you know, is, is AI just an extension uh, and uh, a more efficient version of what we've already done in the past? Right. So but, um, but, but AI is active, right? right? Whereas the tools in the past have been passive. And I think there's a big difference between the active and the passive use of a tool. Um, you two are both in America, so you're speaking about this as Americans, and I'm from England and I live in Europe, and so copyright, the, you're talking essentially about American copyright law, and we have every single jurisdiction has different copyright laws, so having that, I mean, let's not go down there right now, but that's a big obstacle. I, listening to you, and I think transformation, input equals output, input, output, long term... I, I, I can imagine a future, a long way in the future, where the, the, very, the very notion of copyright becomes an antiquity. The, the idea that you could copyright, especially in some domains like computer coding, like how, how you copyright that? We're a, a, glo a, a human hive mind and it belongs to everybody. And maybe um, AI is kind of the, the start of that path to no such thing as copyright. Just because it's just too difficult to ascertain where it lies. 
Yeah, I'm sure Disney wouldn't let that happen, but you know, there are <laughs> Yeah, but they said that about Mickey Mouse, didn't they? Yeah, yeah. What happened well, they're to trying that. a different they're trying the trademark route now, so we'll see how that works <laughs> out for them. But no, I completely agree. It's 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 a real interesting question of how far are we gonna take it? Do we like is this the type of protection we want to keep going into the future? And to the extent that we do, we're gonna have to adapt. It's that's a necessity. I think that's a very good way to end. Adaption is the key to survival, is it not? So yeah, ma amazing discussion. You know, folks in the chat, Odell, Mike, uh, Charlie, bring a friend next time if you like what you heard. Uh, and, uh, you know, jump on these platforms, guys, thinking on paper.xyz. You can see us in any podcast platform. Click a like or follow and subscribe yeah. on our YouTube channel. Mark, before we get out of here, give him a, give him a quick little nudge on the book club. And we'll book club, book club. I don't have a book to meet. Yeah, join our book club and come and join us in one of these little squares that we have here and we can talk about books together. At the moment, we're reading um, The Design of Everyday Things, which is about UX, user experience, good design, bad design, um, across all domains and all industries. So come and join us. We'll be there. Excellent, guys. Thanks, uh, thanks for joining us. Stay disruptive. Be curious. Keep thinking on paper. Take it easy, guys. Thank you, Anthony. Thanks, guys. Take care.